Great, thank you. All right, problem solved. Um, hope you all got some good food and music at lunch. Uh, welcome back. We've got a good afternoon lined up for us. A couple of speakers and in the middle we'll have our um, demo sessions where we can go and network a little bit and see what people are working on. Uh, our next speaker is Kim Reese. We're very excited to have her with us today. Kim's the founder and the head of information visualization at Periscopic, uh, which if you don't know it is a very unique firm that is focused on working with data to help nonprofits, and their slogan is do good with data. And they've worked on all kinds of topics from terrorism to gun violence to medicine and, uh, and other things. I encourage you to check out her site if, uh, or Periscopic site if you haven't already. Um, many of you may also know Kim from uh, the work she's done blogging, uh, from a lot of events that she's spoken at. She's got a number of awards, and uh, she is active on Twitter, and I, I actually love her Twitter feed. Um, Recently she wrote, uh, is it okay that I choose to judge people based on how they represent null? And uh, <laughs> I thought that was something that you know, many of us could, uh, could, could probably relate to. So uh, we're really excited to hear from you today, Kim. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Ellie. Um, I'm glad somebody reads my crazy Twitter feed. Uh, um, I'm really excited to be here today. Uh, I thought it was a mistake when um, Robert Kosara asked me to speak at Tapestry because I'm very anti-storytelling. <laughs> and when he asked me, I thought he'd made a mistake. And I said, Robert, you really don't want me. And he said, ah, I'm sure you'll come up with something. And I was like, oh, gosh, I don't know. Um, but I agreed because I love the idea of Tapestry. I think it's a really unique conference in that it's so intimate and it has a shared focus. Um, and Tableau just it does so much outreach with the community. It's really a wonderful company, so I'm happy to be here. Um, but, um, but my stress over the storytelling piece of it, uh, Robert asked me quite some time ago to, to be a part of this. and. So since then, I've been sort of, you know, really thinking about why do I have such animosity <laughs> for storytelling? Uh, a lot of people really gravitate towards it. So why do I have this feeling? It's just this fundamental, it's just fundamentally wrong with data for me somehow. It's like the, it's like the gold and white dress, you know? It's just, a, it's just wrong. It should not, it should not fit in with data. So. Um, but I think I've always had this, this problem with it because story to me equates to fiction. Um, and it doesn't seem to have a place with data. Uh, because with data, we strive for nonfiction. Um, you know, we don't always get to perfect nonfiction. I don't think that's entirely possible, but we strive as much as we can for nonfiction. Uh, and, and story to me is something that you tell your kids at bedtime. Uh, story transports us out of reality. Um, and the, the idea of storytelling is that it's predicated on this willing suspense of, of, um, of dis suspension of disbelief, which I'm sure you've, you've uh, all heard before. This is a, a common phrase in storytelling and filmmaking and, and other genres. Um, so when we watch a movie, we read a book, we, we sort of transport ourselves. We, we give the author license to take us somewhere else, right? It allows us to beco become engaged with these fantastic and outlandish storylines that we know couldn't possibly be true. You know, it gives us the ability to believe that a grown man could fall in love with the voice of his operating system, <laughs> that Sandra Bullock could fall out of space and land on a beach and be perfectly fine, uh, you know? We go on these wild trips. We, we give the author that license. Um, but to me, that doesn't really work with data. Data is meant to be factual. Um, you can stretch data, but it only has so much elasticity. It can only be bent so far before it breaks. It breaks down. Um, we're meant to be purveyors of truth. Um, and we, so to me, we shouldn't fall into that trap of developing a story. Uh, we're not telling data fictions. Uh, so. What I propose is that we're actually uh, creating doc data documentaries. And that definition works much better for me. But I think that we all sort of, we're talking about the same thing, but just in different ways. It's a semantic 
problem, but I think it's a, it's a good semantic problem to look at. Uh, so to me, the data doc documentary is a nonfiction work based on a collection of data. And I'm going to use one of our iconic pieces from a couple of years ago to, um, to demonstrate what I'm talking about. Uh, I think most of you have probably seen it, but I will play a short video uh, just so you can get um, familiar with it again. And uh, it's, when we made it, we didn't follow the things that I'm going to talk about today, but I think it really illustrates some of those things. The type might be hard to read from a distance. Uh, basically, what you're seeing is each line is a person who was killed by a gun. Uh, it starts in with data from uh, 2010, and then it's repeated again for 2013. Um, and the, the orange line was the person's actual life. Uh, when they're killed, their life continues on in gray as sort of the, their ghost life. What could have been, we based it on um, probability based on um, World Health Organization data. Uh, and then you saw at the end, uh, the viewer was able to explore in various ways. And I'll go into that a little bit uh, further on. Um, so how is a data documentary different than a data story? That's sort of what I've been thinking about lately. Um, because they, they sound pretty similar. I think they use some of the same tactics. Um, but with a story, um, we can think of, you know, if we think about that suspension of disbelief uh, with a documentary, it's sort of the corollary of that. So some people have referred to that as the activation of belief. Uh, so in which we, uh, in making an argument for a certain reality, it allows people to develop a belief in that reality. So there could be other realities out there. Like I said, data is, you know, there's not always one truth in data. Depending on how you look at it, you could find different truths. But as we present a truth to the viewer, we're basically creating an argument for them to believe in. So they're engaged in this one possibility that we're presenting. And the onus is on us to give the viewer enough information and take them to a place where they can form a belief in it. So. How do we activate that belief? That sounds almost as nebulous as uh, st storytelling, right? Um, so with fictional storytelling, uh, the goal is to draw people in through a psychological, um, through various psychological tactics um, in developing characters and plots and taking them um, through a storyline. Uh, with data documentaries, we're really thinking about every new element that we introduce, every new data point that we're presenting, um, we're, we're seeing that as a step forward in an argument, right? So everything is building on argument. Because the success of a data documentary is actually, it depends on the viewer deriving a larger understanding about the topic. So it's kind of like the difference between 
watching an episode of Law and & Order and actually going and seeing a court proceeding, um, whereas Law & Order sort of takes you on this path where it might introduce a character and you see a bit of their life and you sort of walk into their experience with them and it's more about all of these twists and turns with the plot and characters coming in and out of the storyline. Whereas with a court proceeding, uh, it's more about evidence and, and uh, bringing you evidence to the table, building an argument based on evidence. It's much more factual and um, building on top of each other. So one of the aims is to show the world as it is, to give some tangible bearing to the viewer of our experience. So this means the basis is modeled on a historic reality. Now, I don't mean that that means that you have to use time-based data. It just means that it has to have a footing in some reality that happened in the world. And that, that could be happening you know, a split second from prior, if it's real-time data. Or it could be something that happened two years ago or 20 years ago. It just has to be based on some, some factual reality. And we need to model a singular piece of that information. And I'll go into some examples of this. Um, but it's, uh, it's in that presenting of the singular that, that we can then extrapolate into an overall experience and extrapolate into a bigger idea. And I think um, it was RJ who touched on that interpolation idea before. And I think that really ties in perfectly to, um, to what I'm getting at here. So in our visualization, we establish this by um, rolling out each single event in the order that they happened in real life. So this was the first person who was killed in 2013 uh, with a gun. So by showing uh, the age of this person, the name of this person, how old they were, uh, we're bearing witness to that actual event, that singular point in time with that person. We're establishing that singular reality, that substrate of facts that's going to be built upon. It's setting up the understanding of this one person. It's one fact. Here's who he is. Here's when he was killed. He was the first one. And here's how long he might have lived if he hadn't been shot. And then we're on to the second person, and so forth. So rather than show the whole at once and present that big picture, um, we're in, in some abstract form. We ground it in reality first, in the singular pieces, in these singular data points, names, times, ages, a real bearing in a reality. So then you can build into something more abstract. And the viewer still has an understanding of that one and those individual pieces that then form that larger abstract view. And also with presenting a singular piece at a time, you might get the nice side effect that we had of um, we actually got sort of an insight to legend. We didn't have to build a legend because it animated itself over time. We presented each piece in time as it was happening so that the legend was sort of implicit in in the presentation. So it's an invitation to the viewer to regard that specific, that specific as an instantiation of something that's more generalized. Uh, it's, it's building a broader context of that instance over time. So as you can see here, as it rolls out, now we're starting to build that bigger picture based on those individual pieces. So in, in doing that, we can realize that the whole is actually the point of the whole data documentary. Now we're starting to see that it's building onto something. So when we look at the structure that arises there, we can um, see that it sort of follows the inverted pyramid in journalism. So people in journalism, you've probably seen this in Journalism 101. <laughs> um, and I wasn't that familiar with it until I started researching this. And, um, but it really, I think, shows the difference between storytelling and documentary. In that with fictional storytelling, the climax comes at the end. You have all this huge buildup until this like big 
thing that happens at the end. And with journalism and with data storytelling, we get, we have that up front, we have that message up front, that's the main focal point is like a presentation of a truth and now everything that comes after it is going to be an argument for that proposal. So for us, for this um, example, this is our climax. This is what happened after the entire um, animation finished. It took about 45 seconds to get there um, in the actual piece. And it's, a rep it's built through a repetition of about 10,000 of those singular events. So that's the, sort of the punch in the stomach. That is the, that's the message. We could stop there if we wanted to. The message is, is out. It's very clear what we're trying to say. There are a lot of people who got killed with guns. <laughs> um, it's, it could be complete in that form in, in, my, um, in my world. I think that's a, a actual completion of of a data documentary. But really that's just the top of that pyramid, right? So now that's the big message. And a narrative or a, an animation is a great way to introduce that big idea. Because in, in this case, it forces a gaze at this horrible tragedy. It forces someone to take a little bus ride with you into that horror. Um, it's, just, it's just similar to um, you know, when a newspaper has to make a decision on whether to publish a graphic image. It forces an intimacy with that horrific truth. It forces an engagement with it. And it culminates in that message in that top of the pyramid, in that, that big idea. Um, and I think it ties in beautifully with this concept that was proposed by a um, psychological critic by the name of Norman Holland. And he uh, came up with this idea that we have this neuroscientific, um, that there's a neuroscientific approach to the way we, we see and hear things and the way we sort of take that bus ride. That when we hear or watch a narrative, our brains go into wholly perceiving that our critical mind sort of shuts off and we take the little bus ride along that narrative, right? So it may be a little bit of that suspension of disbelief, but it may just be like our brain is saying, I need to pay attention to this trip that I'm taking in an animation or a narrative. And when it drops us off at the bus stop, which is right here, now our brain clicks in to its critical side and now it's forced to, um, think about what the, uh, those truth values are. Which leads into the next point of this model, which is satisfying des the desire to know. So now the person is dropped off at this point where you sent them a big message, whether they believe it at this point or not, or whether they're buying into it, the emotion of it, or the message of it, uh, that's still unknown. So now the onus is on us to bring them into that data and bring them into what we're presenting to them because now they have questions. They inevitably will have questions about what you've just presented. So you started with the idea and you started with this big idea um, and now you need to provide that foundation. And so for us, we, um, I was really resistant to provide too much entryway, but what I found out was that the more openings we provided for people to dig into the data, the more opportunity there was for people to establish that belief in, in what that message was that we were sending to them. So in this view, we've, it's just another presentation of the same lines, but this is a more concrete example that's more understandable. It really shows the deaths over time. The orange is the ages at where people were killed, and the gray is where they probabilistically may have died otherwise if they hadn't been shot. Uh, so some readers might want to get, get more details about the individual pieces. So they can roll over every single line in there. Um, they can find out who this person was, their, um, 
their race, their age, uh, depending on what year they're looking at, because the data's a little bit different for each year. Um, they might be able to get their name. For 2013, they can actually click out into an article about that murder. Um, so we can get really deep into the data as well. Um, with this piece, it was really fun to open up as much of the data as we could. At some point, it was just like, hey, let's just let people explore this however we want. The, the data was really deep, and it was really broad. And it, we provided a number of angles for them to, to enter that data. Um, and another way to explore uh, satisfying that desire to know is to allow the viewer to go on a little fact-finding mission of their own. So this uh, example shows, you might not be able to see it in the back, but there's a little uh, panel at the bottom of the visualization that you can open up, and it gives you all sorts of filters. You can filter on all sorts of crazy stuff. And in this particular example, the viewer is looking at how many uh, murders had multiple victims. Um, but they could filter by region, by relationship to the killer, all sorts of things. Um, but in this way, it lets them explore the things that are interest, interesting to them. It gives them almost a sense of ownership because we're handing over the controls to the viewer, right? So it lets them take the reins for a little while and say, you know what, I'm really interested in the combination of race and age or relationship and region or what have you. Um, you know, for us, it's less of a judgment call. We just sort of open up the, the black box and let people have fun with it. Fun, that's a terrible word to use. <laughs> um, uh, and also in this piece, we uh, put a key findings area on it, which was quite popular, actually. Um, you know, we found that people, there are some people who don't want to explore. They want to know what the buckets are. What are those buckets of information? What do I need to know? What should I take away from this? Uh, and so the idea was to provide some broad themes in that data to give them something concrete as, a, as opposed to letting them wander around in the weeds. Um, so, so that's another approach to satisfying that desire to know. Uh, so the final point uh, in this methodology is kind of a tricky one that I'm still sort of wrestling with, but, uh, but I think it's an important topic. And it's, it's more, of, more of an overarching concept. It's about the space in which the experience lives. Um, so I'm borrowing the term shared exteriority from a guy named Bill Nichols, who I don't know much about him, but I do know that he is sort of the, the key guy who knows about film documentaries. Um, he's written some amazing books and articles on the topic. And, and so he has this concept of a shared exteriority. And so as opposed to storytelling, where in storytelling, the author creates a fictitious space, or a space that may be based on reality. But really, it's a, it's a space that's created by the author where they bring the, the viewer, the reader, um, the audience into that space. But in the data documentary, the vantage point is shared by the author and the viewer. So it's more of a, it's not a crafted space. It's more of a, a box, right? It's a mutual space where the author and the viewer on the, are on the same plane. So it could be a simple space. It's not, it doesn't have to be a huge construction. Um, for this interactive piece, it was very subtle. So if you can remember in the beginning of that video, the way we brought in the UI elements is really that shared space. So it starts off with layering in the title and the year, so you know what it's about. And then it shows you the age axis. And then it shows you the person counter and the stolen years counter. right? So that creates the box. That is the box. It's an austere setting, but it's the box that now the data will start to fill up. 
and then we share that train wreck together. So I've numbered these as though they're steps, but they're not really steps, and they're just sort of these ideas about this methodology. The only reason I number them is because it was my own personal way of ranking them in the way that I thought that they were most important, um, at least in our work, and the way that we would approach uh, the process. Um, and it doesn't, I don't think it's a methodology that works with all data. Um, sometimes you have aggregated data, sometimes you have flawed data, sometimes you don't have much data. You know, not, it's not going to fit every scenario. Um, Sarah Slobin had a great blog post recently about that very thing where she was trying to build a visualization on data, I think it was about a specific disease, I forget exactly what it was. Um, but it was a whole blog post about her frustration about how she couldn't find a visualization that was suitable. And so in the end, she ended up going with photography <laughs> and abandoning the idea of visualization altogether. Uh, and I think we need to give ourselves that license, too. I think that we all have presented these really great ideas and ways of coming at data and different approaches um, today. And they're all fantastic and applicable to certain cases, but not every case. Uh, so I want to go into a couple of other examples um, and how that plays out in, the, in those four points. These two pieces I'm going to show aren't as story-like as the guns visualization. Um, so you can see how it's applied to a less uh, linear piece. So this is a visualization we did about terrorism. And it's using the um, global terrorism database that, is, um, that was developed by the Stark Consortium at the University of Maryland. It's a fantastic database. Um, if you are interested in terrorist acts, it's wonderful. I highly suggest looking into it. It's huge. It's very rich. And I think it covers 30 years. Um, so it starts off on this view where it's uh, a small multiples. The, if you can see the chart at the bottom is the legend. Uh, red is the number of um, people who were killed. Yellow is the number of people wounded. And then the bar is sort of like a heat matrix in the middle of um, each month within that year, uh, and then color coded by how many incidents uh, of terrorism were in that month. And each of these multiples is a different uh, group who is using terrorist tactics. Uh, so going to the first point of modeling on historical reality. So each chart is modeling that. So it's this sort of heat matrix and bar chart combo deal. <laughs> I'm not sure what to call that chart. Uh, so that's based in a reality. Every month is a singular month that's relaying a lot of information. Every year is a singular year that has another set of information. Uh, and it's over time. And uh, when we tie them together, it creates sort of the, that bigger picture. So it's the inverted pyramid. Uh, now, I think we could have done it a little bit better if we had taken this approach into consideration when we made this. Um, you can see on the the way it opens is a very um, sort of agnostic look at the piece. It just starts in alphabetical order. Um, but if we wanted to take that more um, documentary approach, we might lead with that, that overarching theme, that big message of you know maybe it's the, the groups who have had the most victims, or the groups who've been most active recently, or we could have applied some other theme that would have had a bigger message. But you could see that you could build something like that out of the small multiples, because you use, them, you use those singular pieces to tie into a bigger message. Uh, so satisfying the need to know. Again, this had a lot of different ways of exploring that data. Uh, you could select a specific group. In this view, it's showing ISIS. So when you uh, click on it, it fills that larger graph at the bottom. Um, you know, it expands actually to fill all of 
the uh, space that ISIS needed. It needed to expand because ISIS is so active. Um, it shows you the region where they're active. You can also uh, scrub that timeline to focus just on specific years if you wanted to. Um, and the shared exteriority is, so it's in that mutual space of, of the viewer and the author. You know, we're, we're sort of innocents who are looking at this world of terrorism. We're looking at this problem um, from the outside in order to gain a better understanding of it. And this is a piece that we did recently with uh, Scientific American. And they wanted to show uh, basically what is the gender gap in uh, PhDs in higher education. So, uh, so we approached it. They had lots of different data. It was covering, I think, 56 different countries. Um, it's broken down in a number of different ways. Uh, so it was a really interesting piece to look at. Um, so. Going back to point number one, modeling in historical reality. Uh, so here, each country is that singular piece uh, whereby we can extrapolate to the larger whole. So presenting them uh, next to each other, each country, and then divided by uh, gender, we can see the difference. So blue, blue, it looks a little green on the screen. So the greenish blue is, is male, the orange is, is female. Where they cross over is uh, where the gender gap narrows, and then it might split off in certain cases, like it does here, um, where certain countries have the reverse uh, gender gap, which is pretty interesting. I'm noting also that a lot of these are um, examples of the seven story types that Ben brought up this morning. Um, so even though I don't believe in storytelling, they're good <laughs> examples. <laughs> of storytelling. <laughs> uh, so with this piece, the, um, the inverted pyramid was really the journalistic piece that's at the top. It's that paragraph that's at the top that uh, presents that main idea about the gen gender gap in higher education. Uh, and that was provided by Scientific American. They, um, they sort of posited an idea and then show the data to support it. So satisfying uh, the, the desire to know, there are a lot of different ways to explore this. We broke it down by types of PhDs. So it goes into STEM and non-STEM degrees. In, in STEM degrees, it goes into all of the different sciences. So it um, goes into engineering, computer science, um, biology, chemistry. It goes into lots of different uh, breakdowns of that. So you can just Quick, uh, quickly delve into each of those separately. It's fun to just uh, click through them to see the, the dots shift and move based on the, the gaps. Um, you can look at uh, t the comparison for uh, female and male to all PhDs given in gray. And you can also explore specific countries if you want. Uh, and then you can ex also explore by region, which is my favorite, because you start to see these really interesting um, flip-flops almost. Like in this example, it's showing uh, Europe has a gender gap uh, in one direction, and in the Middle East, it has completely the opposite gender gap. So you can start to see these huge disparities and just through different ways of playing with the data. Uh, so here, the shared exteriority is uh, that most of us identify with one of these genders. Uh, most of us identify with one of these countries, their major countries. It's a sort of a shared space to, to enter that. If it were focused just on women in Alabama, it would be different. That would be more of an interior discussion, ex ex excluding a lot of people. Um, but this exteriority is sort of the idea that we're presenting a large space that we can all sort of look at from, from the outside. 
so the data documentary is, uh, you know, like I said, it's merely one approach that we can apply to our data. It's suitable for a lot of different things, but probably not everything. Uh, and but to me, I think it's probably it's at least in my mind, it's an appropriate extension uh, for storytelling with data. Thank you. So I have a uh, mic on this side. Tara has it on that side. So who would, uh, who would like to start? I know with this group there's some questions. Hi, I really liked the talk. And I really found that uh, chart with about gun deaths really powerful, which I hadn't seen before. But one of the things that occurred to me when I saw it, and this is only a half form of thought, but um, is I remember reading a study uh, once about fundraising letters and if you send they sent like half the people fundraising letters that was sort of about this girl Maya is starving in Africa please help her and then they sent another half like there are two million people starving in Malawi please help her and I can't remember the exact numbers but the they got way better response from the one about this the one little girl and, and I'm just wondering what your thought is about this sort of tool that we all use to sort of visualize and abstract these problems how, how you do that while still getting people to care and does the act of abstraction mm -hmm. make it easier for people to distance themselves from the horror of what you're depicting? Right. Um, yeah, I think that's a good question. Uh, I think you went into it in your talk a little bit, <laughs> uh, which I loved, actually. And I think it ties in to some of my thoughts about the, the idea, uh, that, that question. Um, you know, I think that by building on that singular and then doing the the sort of zoom out. I think like the guns piece was sort of, uh, you know, it does it the, you know, going to Ben's seven story types. I think he had like, would you have a drill down and a zoom out? You know, I think those could be used together to have the singular and the abstracted view. And, you know, maybe we can do the zoom in and um, drill down work together so that you can get those singular pieces, those individual stories. And I think that's one of the reasons the gun visualization was so popular because it gave you names and ages and of these horrible events. It lets you into the lives of those people, um, but then also abstracted it out into this big picture where you're, you know, you get hit in the stomach. Like we had a, um, a friend at Twitter who said, you know, when I saw that piece, I started watching it and I said, oh, oh God, oh God, please make this stop. <laughs> and that's sort of what you're going with, with the, the abstraction, like the O oh is like, oh geez, that sucks, that guy got killed. And then the oh God, please make it stop is like there's this horrible mass of those singular events. Um, so I think both are valuable in their own ways, but tying them together, I think, can be a really beautiful solution. So one of the things that I struggle with in data visualization is teaching people how to read them. And you do a lot of work with clients who maybe haven't done a complex visualization project before. How do you approach teaching clients how to read and judging who the audience for the piece is and what you need to do to cue them along with that? Yeah, that is a, that's something we have to, something we struggle with every day. Um, one, I think it's getting a lot better. I think with, um, with people pushing the boundaries of data visualization, just with the sheer amount of visualization that's coming out, it's really helping with data literacy. So, so I'm seeing people becoming much more sophisticated in that respect, which is fantastic. Now, there are still problem areas, of course. There always will be. Um, but I think that's a, that's a really good trend. Um, the other is, uh, you know, we really try to focus on that introduction, that soft introduction, that gentleness where we're sort of bringing you along in a way where we're introducing elements and sort of telling you what they are. We're not overwhelming you with everything all at once. Um, so that soft introduction, I think, really helps out a lot. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's tough. It's a tough area. It's, it's something that I think, as practitioners, we can become blind to over time because we're so familiar with it. Uh, so getting a reality check from real users is 
very beneficial, very counterintuitive. I hate doing it, but there, there are times when you're like, okay, let me just show you this and let's see if it feels right. Um, so yeah, I mean, we've definitely been surprised. Uh, we had to completely redo a visualization once because, um, because of that very problem. And it was kind of interesting because it wasn't so much that there wasn't an understanding. Um, we actually did usability testing on it and the users all completed the, um, the tasks in the usability testing. It was by a wide margin, like 95% of them got all of the answers right. Uh, but the problem was that we, we also videotaped the, the interactions and almost every single person was unsure of <laughs> their path through the data. <laughs> so even though they got there and they got the right answers, and they knew how to use it, they didn't trust themselves. And, and it was that, that sort of lag, I think, in the liter literacy piece, that you know, people are willing to go down that path, even if it's sort of experimental, but there's that uneasiness of going down that path. So there is gonna be a lag in there for a while, I think, but the more we can push people to move beyond that, I think the better we are. How or why did you choose to say such specific information about the way someone would die? Because it seemed like the yellow part of it was very specific about an individual, and the white part was just made up almost, right? It was, I mean, it was based on some data. I guess I'm wondering how, why did you choose to get so specific with the projections? Um, because we could. And because the more specific you can make something, I think the more that people can relate to it. If we just said, oh, a person died when they were 32 and they might have lived till they were 84, is much different than saying a black man age 32 whose name was Derek Willis was shot by his friend and could have lived to be 82 and died of a malignant tumor. Uh, because we had that data, and it got, it, I think it does lend some believability to it because it is real data. It's data based on the rates of heart disease and all of the diseases and net causes of death that are listed in the piece. So to me, it was more of a like, okay, we know the specifics about how this person died in reality. Um, so let's get as realistic as we can about the, how they might have died otherwise. So I think it it builds more believability into the piece rather than just saying they could have died at 82. But it's also not accurate to say that. Not accurate to say it could have died from a malignant tumor? Yeah. How so? Well, because it's based on a different data set, right? I mean, you're projecting that they could I'm have projecting, died. projecting, right. It's based on, on probability of, of actual data about those diseases. You don't think it's accurate? Well, not to say that that individual might have died or, or, or would have died from that specific well, that's thing. That's the semantics, right? I, we're not saying they would have died. We don't know. You know I have no idea. That could, person could have been a chain smoker and they could have died of lung cancer the day after they got shot. Right. You know? So <laughs> it's not entirely accurate, though, to say it's that. It's not entirely accurate. Exactly. I mean, but we never will be entirely accurate. You know, the CDC isn't walking around following people and seeing if you're a chain smoker, right? <laughs> I mean, it's only as accurate as the data can get. So to me, we could have said, you could have died at age 82. That's just as accurate as saying you could have died at age 82 of a malignant tumor. It's all based on the same probability based on the factors that we knew. I'm curious, though, if I could ask a, a follow-up question. Um, and I, I admire uh, you for going out there and sort of fighting the fight against storytelling <laughs> um, since, <laughs> since that's what so, so, so many of us talk about. Um, but I'm curious specifically about, about this point and how you square um, storytelling with this fictional world, with you know, perhaps data, with more with documentary, um, when this element in particular strikes me as something where you are bringing some sort of 
fictional hypothetical elements into your storytelling and that soft open mm -hmm. um, that you are using a bit of scene setting to set the stage. So how do you square that um, with your thesis around documentary versus storytelling? Right, yeah, I, I agree that some of the tactics are the same. And, uh, you know, I talk a lot about the emotive and, and using emotion in order to help create that stage. So I, yes, there are elements of storytelling, I guess. To me, it's not storytelling, it's more emotive. It's more of a visceral response that we're trying to create. We're, it's, a, it's a stage setting um, in order to get someone to the point where um, we're trying to create a belief in, in that underlying data. There's a whole spectrum within that of like, completely going to like data art or completely just going with a line chart, right? Um, there's a, where you land in there is, you know, personal choice, I think. Um, and depending on what your goals are and where you're, uh, you know, what audience you're trying to reach or what, you know, how specific you want to get or how believable you want to be or how you know, rigid you want to look. Uh, you know, there are all sorts of things that go into that. Um, the gun visualization was made at a very emotional time in our country. It was right after the killings in Newtown. And we wanted people to have a conversation about it. It wasn't meant to be a, um, have an opinion. It was meant to be a point where we could look at data um, but we knew we also had to get people to look at the data. We couldn't just have another bar chart that people would just dismiss, you know. So that was, that was a choice. All of these, you know, there are so many choices that go into a visualization. I had a whole talk um, that I was going to give about every decision along the path of, of building a visualization and how it's, um, the repercussions of each choice along the way and how they build to a bigger um, bigger piece and how they roll into this iteration of, of building that piece. Uh, so there are you know, thousands of, of questions that we have to answer along that way, um, thousands of choices we need to make and you know, you have to live with them. Uh, and I mean, it's, it's interesting because um, Jonathan Quorum, who's sitting in the back over there, was really, he gave this beautiful critique of the gun visualization, uh, which I love because it forced us to look at some of those things. And, and his take was slightly different uh, in that he, he felt that there was some uh, accuracy that was lost uh, and he presented a different idea uh, for representing the data. Uh, that which wasn't much difference. It was just a little tweak on how we were representing the data, and it was beautiful. It's a beautiful way of looking at it. And I think the more people who are being critical thinkers of what's being presented, the better. Um, and you might may come at the data from or the topic from a different point. Um, you might have your own ideas about the way it's be pre being presented. You might reject it outright. You might be really engaged by it. It's, you know, again, it's a personal, personal thing. Uh, okay, so that was sort of more what I was trying to ask is how, how did you decide which person would be assigned what thing? I guess what I'm looking at, it's you know, some of the projections that I want to do and I guess I don't want to make, yeah, false assumptions or mm -hmm. assign to some real person some Right. It's right. So it's based on probability and it's all calculated. It's mathematical. It's an algorithm that decides, you know, based on statistics, based on the age of this person, based on their gender, um, where do they fall in the, it, and I, I encourage you to look at the sources of the piece. If you go to guns.periscopic.com, um, you can go to the source and actually download the data and then you could see exactly the data points that we're pulling out of the, that actuarial data and how we calculated, you know, based on when this person died, if they hadn't been shot, what's, you know, it's just like if you went to the doctor today and said, what could I die of? What are my chances? What's my lifespan look like? They could give you a chart and say, well, you have an 82% chance of getting heart disease when you're in your 80s. Um, that sort of thing. That's exactly what we're doing. 
right? Is this making yeah, sense? It was, yeah, it was okay. a really beautiful thing. All right. Other questions? So very interesting talk, and I, I, uh, I think we, we, we need to have kind of a, a different point of view here. So that's, I think that's exactly why we, why we asked you to come here and give the talk. Though I would like to challenge your, your dichotomy here a bit, because when you watch a documentary, th at the end credits, there's usually somebody there who's credited as the writer of that documentary. And a good documentary tells a story. So I'm wondering, you know, story, documentary, can it be both? Yeah, I think that there's, um, they're definitely related. And, you know, within the realm of documentary, there's, again, that whole spectrum of, like, are you just reading fictual, factual documents? You know, is it just a narration of factual documents and, and historical footage? Or is it a Ken Burns documentary where there's a narration, there's a writer, there are actors who are acting out historical events, there are all sorts of camera tricks that are played, and it's, it is more of a story. So I think, yeah, it's a continuum. It definitely is a continuum, because I also don't believe that there is a true documentary, because anything that we look at in hindsight isn't really true anymore. <laughs> uh, so it, it's definitely a spectrum. Um, and you know, there's a spectrum from, of documentaries and then storytelling, and there's some overlap within, within that space as well. Great. Other questions? So you spoke a little bit about how you were going to give a talk about the decisions that mm -hmm. you take along the way, and then you kind of, I think you threw that, that <laughs> overboard somehow. <laughs> Could you just give us an example of um, when you've been working on a project and you've got to a certain point where you thought, oh my God, like five decisions ago was when we should totally have bailed, should have gone into um, a completely another route. Could you be a bit more specific? I mean, you don't have to name the client, yeah, yeah. but I'd be really interested in how you make those decisions and when in, the, when in trying to protect your data and being accurate, you sort of change course. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. That is, oh gosh, that is the heart. That's the stuff that's just like a stab in the chest when you're working. Um, that's a tough area. The way we try to combat that is by getting as much information, as much data as we can up front. We try to gather all that fodder because the fewer unknowns we have, the f less likelihood that is, there is of that happening. We're extremely rigorous at the outset. Uh, so the, you know, we have data scientists, data explorers in-house in where they will explore the data and they'll come up with a lot of different ways of representing it. And we have this iterative approach of whittling that down to, you know, the best, best presentation method. Um, through that process, it's extremely rigorous. It may start with just these general broad strokes, but very quickly we throw real data into it, you know, throw the full breadth of data, really think about how is this going to work, um, what's the user experience going to be like, um, you know, ask, basically craft the system in our minds before we settle on one of those, um, one of those representations. We don't always get it right, you know. There's, you know, there are all sorts of factors that could come into play. Um, you know, we've had all sorts of things thrown at us, but um, but it does get you closer. The more you can be very rigorous about that up front, the better. Um, there are times when the right answer just doesn't come. You know, I think I really like the the terrorism piece we did, but to me, it's it still didn't really hit the spot where I wanted it to hit. And there's just a point where you have to say, you know, this is, it is what it is. You have to make a judgment call and decide on if you're gonna move ahead or not. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, that, that realization can come at any point, but the goal is to sort of front load that, that area of, of problem um, so that you can uncover those as quickly as possible. When you were talking about storytelling and how you um, 
don't really like storytelling. Well, I, th I think you probably do like storytelling, <laughs> but um, but <laughs> but I was thinking that the gun piece was so compelling and so well done, and actually sort of feeling quite anxious with the sound effects mm -hmm. um, as it was going through, mm -hmm. with the heavy breathing. I mean, it was really mm -hmm. horrible, actually. Mm -hmm. um, it made me feel pretty anxious. But then the um, terrorism one was um, kind of dull mm -hmm. and really hard to extrapolate the information. You had to really, really mm -hmm. search. So I wonder which mm -hmm. one do you prefer? And um, because the one is obvious storytelling and the other one is left up to your own devices. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's tough. I mean, I like the guns piece uh, just because I think it was a very elegant solution. Um, and just to note, the audio is not, that's just something we use for presentation. That's not actually in the live piece. Um, but um, yeah, I don't know. I like them for different reasons. I like the elegance of the guns piece. I like that you can comp do a lot of comparisons in the terrorism piece. I see a lot of potential if we wanted to expand on it and really start to draw some conclusions about the different groups and the different tactics we could expand on it. Um, so I think there's a lot more room for, um, for more data exploration when th within that piece. And it's more, that to me is more of an exploratory tool and has a potential for academic usage um, potentially at some point, whereas the guns piece is more of a like, I'm going to hit you in the stomach and, you know, like leave you there. <laughs> you can explore it, but really it's, me it's, more of, it's much more of an emotive piece. Hey, back here. Um, quick question, um, Andy Cox with the Weather Channel. Um, more of a technical question too. So the gun piece, when you're generating those probabilities or whatever, um, are they essentially, do you do that one time or do you generate a new set every time somebody loads it and runs it? So is it kind of done on the fly or is it more of, you know, you did it one time and that's what everybody gets? Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, I think that we ended up um, right at, we used to calculate, calculate it each time. Um, when it was running live, and then I think at a certain point when it was getting a tons of traffic, we switched it so that it was just one fixed thing. Yeah. Um, so again, it kind of goes back to that the, the yeah. question earlier today about communicating model data, right? And right. you do a different, you know, I don't want right. to continue right, right. beating on this, but another analogy I thought was um, the, I think during last year's election, the thing the upshot did where you basically spin the wheel to get, uh, get a Senate forecast, and so you get a different result each time, but that mm -hmm. shows you how kind of forecasting works and that it right, isn't always right, exactly right. the same thing. So exactly. I don't know if you thought of an approach like that. that maybe exactly. Could. Yeah, exactly. And I would love it to be calculated on the fly. I would love to have even more richer ways of modeling that alternative death. Um, you know, unfortunately, it's... Yeah, it's right off, basically. Though. Exactly. Exactly. So... Thanks. Yep. Um, I have a question about something you just said. Uh, just maybe I want to understand the context. Uh, you said anything we look at in hindsight isn't true anymore. Now I'm thinking, are we talking about a documentary since we are talking about, let's say, a story or a documentary of something that happened before, not r before this moment in time? Is that what are you saying that we tend to embellish or we... Uh, no, not so much that we embellish, just that I think we have different perception if we are given the time to look back on something, you know? Like if I asked you to look back on your day yesterday and what you, made you feel good and what made you feel bad would probably be different than what you were experiencing in the moment of your day. You know, like I may look back at yesterday and say, oh, you know, I had so much fun doing that art project with my kids, but in reality, when I was living it, it was very <laughs> stressful because I had to clean up all the paint that they spilled on the floor. Um, you know, we, I think the perception of something is, is different um, if you are um, given the luxury of time to look at it. Um, I had a further question uh, related to your, the conflict you expressed at the beginning of the talk on stories versus um, data or um, documentary style um, portrayal of information. Um, 
What do you do about, or is there a time when it's appropriate to use personal stories? Because those are true too, and they exist in the real world, and they can be very powerful ways of, um, you know, giving an example of the data. Or, um, like for example, when you had the the first uh, or one of the little arcs that was uh, represented a little boy who was killed by his father. I mean, there's much more of a story in there, and that's true and real. Um, are there appropriate times, you know, in your work when you can tell more of that story mm -hmm. um, and when that can add to the power of what you're trying to communicate? Absolutely. I think that's, um, I think that's something that's employed uh, in journalism, you know, very regularly and I think with, you know, to great effect. Um, we don't tend to do it as much in our work just because it's more focused on um, just the data visualization side of it. Uh, but I think that people have great success in tying those individual stories and then bringing them into that bigger picture of, of the overall. Um, so certainly, I think that's a really good way of drawing people in. It does go more into the storytelling, even though it is a true, true story. It's, you know, it is a document of somebody's experience. Um, you know, I think those are very effective ways of of finding a common ground with the viewer, for sure. Great. Thank you very much, Kim. All right. Thank you. Yeah.